Hi, my name is Fiona Crichton. I'm one of the Deputy Investigation Officers at SRUC. Um, and our role is really veterinary surveillance and looking for new and novel diseases within the animals. But today we're going to talk about the responsible use of antibiotics. And I've subtitled it The Real World Worlds. So, H.G. Wells, about uh, in the turn of the last century, wrote about this, the, the invasion of Mar Martians. And the Martians did quite a good job of, of dominating um, the humans until they were brought down by the smallest of uh, uh, organisms, bacteria. And we have evolved with bacteria um, and have an immune system that um, can cope with them. But in the 1940s, we started mass producing antibiotics. And that added to our, our ability to fight bacterial infections that had overwhelmed the immune system. And we've since developed a range of antibiotics um, to, to add to that fight. But is, is this a sustainable way of, of going forward? And that's what we're going to have a wee chat about today. So where are bacteria? Quite frankly, they're everywhere. They're in the soil, they're in the air, and they're in water, they've adapted to, to live in the coldest of climates and the warmest of climates um, on our planet. And they are everywhere and they are, are diverse. Um, and they also live on and in us. We have more animal, more bacteria living on us and in us than there are cells of ourselves to say. In fact, there's about 10 times as many bacterial cells currently on your skin and within your digestive tract than there is cells of your own human body because they are so small and they are completely hidden from, from normal view. Uh, but though they are, and they, they are exposed to, to various things, that's what you're exposed to such as antibiotics. So when we use antibiotics, the antibiotics enter our body either by, by um, taking tablets or by injecting. Our entire bacteria in our bodies get exposed to those antibiotics. And depending on the, the way the, these the antibiotics act, they can kill the bacteria. But there's only a limited number of ways that we can kill bacteria without killing the thing that we've, we've given them to, so the human or the animal. And there's only a limited number of ways that antibiotics act on bacteria to kill them. So what happens when we are exposed to an antibiotic is that we have this mixed population of bacteria and then in amongst them are some that have just innate resistance. They, they have just had a quirk of their genes that has allowed them to survive the bacterial presence. And under the influence of bacteria, they survive much better than those that are susceptible, and you end up with a, a, a more resistant population of bacteria. And that's where your side effects from antibiotics come in. You know, we've all had a little bit of diarrhea, and that's just your own microbiome being affected by the bacteria that you're taking. So, in addition to generating the, um, the resistant bacteria, these resistant bacteria are in the environment, around your skin and you, you spread them around. Those ant resistant bacteria also have the ability, because they hold the, the resistance on little plasmids, little bits of genetic uh, information, and these plasmids, they can hand in between, between themselves, and they can, they can spread that bacteria without being exposed to the antibiotics. They can expose them to that resistance, get spread, they go, here you go, have my little the resistant plasmids, that will help you survive. You know, exposed to antibiotics in the future. So when we think about it, these antibiotics here are either prescribed by a doctor to give to humans or prescribed by a vet to, to give to animals. And these antibiotics are classified. Uh, the European Medicines Agency classifies the antibiotics. There is a priority use. There's a class A that are used for only humans. There's class B that are available to, to vets and for use in animals, but they're called the high priority, critically important antibiotics. And they are for use only when nothing else will work. And we try and protect those and, and um, not use them unless we absolutely have to. Glasses A, B, and, sorry, C and D are the ones that are more readily available to farm animals. So as you can see, 
they get prescribed, there's this selection process that we've already talked about, and then we get the spread of resistant bacteria. And because they're on the skin, because they're in the environment, they can spread throughout people that you're coming into contact with. Additionally, because uh, most antibiotics are shed in urine or faeces, and they're shed generally as a whole active compound, when we give them to our farm species, they end up in the environment. And so they end up on the soil um, and you know, within the environment where we can come into contact with them indirectly if our hygiene measures aren't great. And so we then get the spread of resistant bacteria through the soil and water. The other way that there's a potential to be exposed to antibiotics is through meat. And every antibiotic that you have or use has a meat withdrawal. And that meat withdrawal is given both on the packaging, on the bottle, on the data sheet. There's loads of places to have it, but that is the, the way that you prevent exposure to antibiotics through meat. And you must adhere to, to the meat withdrawals every time you use an antibiotic. So realistically, how much antibiotic do we use in the UK? These are figures from 2017, but as you'll see later, the usage hasn't changed greatly. At the moment, we do still use more antibiotics in humans, about 64% of antibiotics are still used in humans, but a good 282 tonnes of antibiotic are given to farm animals and pets, which is a, a significant amount, especially when you think of most antibiotics are measured in milligrams. So we go from milligrams to grams to kilograms to tons. That is a significant amount of antibiotic being used. And it's only by reducing antibiotics wherever we can and in every situation we can that we can reduce this number down. Because we want to reserve them um, to, to cure our nearest and dearest should they get a bacterial infection. Why should we care? How big a problem is it? Well, back in 2014 there was a worldwide antibiotic review and this was starting to, to gain a bit of speed and a bit of awareness as, as to what the problem was. And at that point they estimated worldwide about 700,000 people a year are dying of antibiotic resistance. And that basically means they have a bacterial infection which there is no antibiotic to cure and they die of that bacterial infection like we were back in the, in the early, early 1900s, before the advent of antibiotics. If nothing is done, these guys predicted, they did some modelling, and they predicted if nothing is done, by the time we get to 2050, which is only 30 years' time, there could be as many as 10 million people dying every year because of resistant bacterial infections. If we don't do something to reduce the amount of antibiotics that we are feeding to animals and we are taking ourselves, that's where we're going to be, and that's quite a scary situation. So, within agriculture, RUMA are the responsible use of medicines in agriculture. They have, they're a, a collection of interested parties, all their logos are down the bottom there, who have basically got together to discuss the best way of using all medicines in animals, and that includes antibiotics. And as things were, were gaining speed with the limiting the use of antibiotics in agriculture, they developed a, um, a, a working group. And so that working group was made up of one vet and one producer, one leading producer from each um, of the food production sector. So everything from fish farming through poultry, pigs, um, sheep, cattle, um, as long with some, some other stakeholders that had a vested interest in, in antimicrobial, effective antimicrobial use. And they set some industry targets. And they started off with the low hanging fruit, the easy stuff to do. And they did quite a good job, they just about halved antibiotic use in the UK really quite quickly. But then, as we look, we can see that they, they, they halved it initially, but since then, progress has slowed. We've got the low hanging fruit, we've got the easy gains, it's now time that we really have to look at the little gains, and that's where each individual person has, has a role to play in preventing antibiotics resistance. And so 2018 figures, only about 6% is used in dogs and cats and much more is used in, in the farm animal, about 213 tonnes that year. And that is partially a function of cattle and sheep being bigger than dogs and cats um, and also you know, cattle being bigger than humans. And we 
just need, if you're giving so many milligrams per kilogram, we're treating more kilograms. Fabulous. Very nice. So, looking at resistance, we've looked at how much we're going to use. If we then start and turn and think about resistance, how do we know something's resistant? How do we know um, that that bacteria is not going to die when exposed to that antibiotic? And I don't know if you've ever had bacterial cultures taken, be that a wound infection, um, but a swab gets taken, sent to the laboratory, and that laboratory grow the bacteria that are in that, that wound. Um, having grown it, they then make a little film of it over the whole, whole surface of an agar plate. They put little antibiotic impregnated discs throughout the agar plate and that causes a, um, a diffusion gradient out into the agar. And we can see in most cases there's a nice clear area where there's no growth of antibiotic there. Antibiotics and bacteria there. Oh, apologies. Um, and that antibiotic will be effective in killing that bacteria. But we can see there's a few places where those antibiotics are not killing that bacteria. And no, that bacteria is resistant to that antibiotic. So when we look at the situation on our farms, um, this is watery mouth, which is an E. coli infection of neonatal lambs. So very newborn lambs can get watery mouth and it's, it's pretty fatal when they get it. And they, this, this project looked at the, the resistance profiles on several different farms, and some of the, um, the farms are pictured there. Each of those um, colour blocks down the bottom is a different antibiotic, and a different antibiotic available to, to the farmer. And we can see that farm seven, the profile of their E. coli, is really good though. They've got no evidence of resistance, which is, is great. When we look at farm four and farm nine, there's quite a significant spectrum of resistance of E. coli on that farm. There, you know, that those E. coli are resistant to a number of bacteria, bacteria antibiotics. If you look down here at enrofloxacin, that's one of our critically important antibiotics, and you can see just there we're creeping into resistance to, to a critically important antibiotic. And you know, should you fall over, scrape your knee on that farmyard, get E. coli in a cut. There's a good number, you go to hospital, there's a good number of antibiotics that that doctor is going to reach for in the first line to treat your infected wound that aren't going to work. Um, and as this progresses, as you use more an by antibiotics, as this progresses, that situation is only going to get worse and worse on farms. So how do we reduce antimicrobial resistance? Really, the only way to reduce antimicrobial resistance is to reduce how much antibiotic we are using. And we all need to take our part in that, be that not going to the doctor looking for antibiotics when the doctor says it's not needed, not going to the vet looking for antibiotics when the vet says it's not needed. And if you do happen to have a bottle of antibiotics available to you, using it in a really responsible manner. And when we talk about that, we want to identify the bacterial disease. We want to be sure that when we see a sick animal, that that has a bacterial component to its illness. And having convinced ourselves that there's a bacterial component to that incident, or a high likelihood of bacteria being involved, we want to treat early. We want to treat it before it's got too far, before that infection got too established. We want to select the correct drug. And that's a really easy thing to say, and it's a much more challenging thing to do because we need to have knowledge of what bacteria are likely to be affecting that animal. We need to know um, what antibiotic is likely to be able to kill that, that bacteria, and we need to know um, if there's a, a likelihood of that bacteria being resistant to that drug. So there's a lot of, a lot of knowledge that needs to get the correct drug. The correct dose we need to use, most antibiotics have a dose per kilo um, written on them on the packaging on the data sheet available to you. That's, that's nice and straightforward, we can work that out with some maths. The bit that is tricky is that vets and farmers, and I suspect I'm going to extend this to smallholders too, really struggle to estimate the weights of animals and very commonly underestimate the weights. On average, in an average size sheet, they're looking at about 10 kilos underestimate, which means you get underdosing, which is a bad thing from an antibiotic resistance. 
and then you want to, to treat for the correct duration. If you go to the doctor, it's very, very rare that you get a single dose of antibiotics to fix your problem. There is usually a course involved. But how many of us have the inclination to just give a single shot of antibiotic and hope that cures things? So we need to be aware of how long that we need to be treating each individual condition. So, this is the audience participation bit. You'll be glad you're one of six people standing watching at this point. <laughs> can anyone tell me a bacterial disease that we can vaccinate against? And in vaccinating against, we then don't get the disease and we don't need that antibiotics to have to treat it. I'm going to get a stunned silence. All right, come on. There's only seven people in the room. One each. One, uh, that is one each. Excellent idea. <laughs> no, pardon? Foot rot. Foot rot. Excellent. Foot rot is a bacterial disease. And we can use um, antibiotics to put back somewhere in the corn there. And we can use um, vaccination to help control that disease. I'm going to get no more from you, so you might as well go to the next slide where I give the answer. So there's quite a few conditions that we can um, control with vaccination. Um, I'm going to go to the bottom. Enzootic abortion is a bacterial abortion. Back in the past, we farmers definitely used. Um, antibiotics control it. They gave oxytetracycline in late pregnancy to try and control endotic abortion. But there's a vaccine. We can do that with a vaccine now, and that's definitely where we should be going to do things. Um, the past, the sorry, clostridial diseases you'll hopefully be reasonably familiar with. This is things like pulpy kidney, black leg, black's disease, lamb dysentery, and um, hopefully these are ringing a few bells. And these are your clostridial diseases. They also include tetanus, and most of the time when you vaccinate against these, there's a tetanus in these vaccines. And they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere in the environment. And if you have animals that are outdoor, more than likely you're going to come into contact with them and you're going to want to protect them. Um, so this is just a little um, study that was done. We have 207 flocks and 8 vet practices. Now, except these are probably larger flocks than we're dealing with with smallholders, but I think the principles still stand true of when you are most likely to use your antibiotics. Um, so we can see there's a peak. I uh, hope everyone can see there's a peak. Um, oh, I should have explained. So down the bottom, the black down the bottom is oxytetracycline. That is your engemycin, alamycin, and um, everything that's sold in a whole heap of different forms, but that's that drug there. The orange bars are your penicillins, um, so pen and strep, depicillin, um, amoxicillin, there's lots of, lots of different forms again, but we can see around lambing there's a significant peak in antibiotic use. So what can we do in our lambing sheds that is going to reduce the need to use antibiotics? Hygiene, it almost goes without saying, but I felt I should say it. Um, improving hygiene is going to reduce the amount of bacteria that are, that are in your lambing pens, um, and that will reduce disease. Um, something that we sometimes see is this standard, I have lamb to you, therefore I need to give her some antibiotics. You just don't. Um, they're pretty well designed to, to withstand some infection at that point. Uh, if you've got clean hands, if you've used a glove, and even if you've got slightly dirty hands, there's absolutely no need to routinely give antibiotics at the time of lying. Something that sometimes gets overlooked in a really busy lambing period is disinfecting things that we maybe should be disinfecting, such as stomach tubes and feeding bottles, um, just some household milt and give them, give them a wee soak um, overnight, um, and they'll be good to go again in the morning. If taking the time to do that really does make a difference. And also different other things like your ear tires and your water buckets. Keeping, keeping them nice and clean has some value as well. And then just generally within the lambing shed, you want to disinfect as much as you can before they come inside for lambing. Um, you want to use clean, dry bedding. You want to make sure your ventilation is really good within the, within the lambing shed. Um, and all of that will reduce the, the risk of getting infections in your own Colostrum is gold. If you want your little lambs to survive, make sure they get colostrum. It is the absolute foundation stone 
a neonatal lamb survival. If you want your lambs to live, do colostrum. So your colostrum um, carries a lot of energy, it's high energy that lets them, keeps them nice and warm, um, and it also contains immunoglobulins. They see, these immunoglobulins um, make up the lamb's immune system for the first 8 to 12 weeks of life, and without colostrum, they pretty much don't have an immune system. They are born with effectively holes in their guts that these big immunoglobulins can pass through. After six hours, these, um, these holes start closing up and they're less able to absorb the immunoglobulins. So you have to make sure that you get a lot of colostrum into your lab in the first six hours of life. Up to 24 hours, we still have the capacity to absorb some. So you're looking over the first 24 hours of life to get about 200 mils per kilo um, into your lambs. So for a little lamb that's a bit over a pint and for a decent sized lamb that's two pints which is a significant amount for a, for a lamb to get into. But if you do that everything else gets easy. Um, so you're going to reduce the risk of your neonatal diseases doing that and once again there's absolutely no need um, to use a blanket antibiotic treatment in your lambing shed. So the likes of your, your Spectam that some of you might be familiar with using to prevent watery mouth, it can be used strategically, it has a place, but I think the current thinking is it definitely, definitely does not need to be given to every lamb. There's no need to give every lamb antibiotics at birth. There's lots of other things you can get your hygiene right, get your colostrum right, and watery mouth becomes much less of an issue in your lambing shed. So if we have a little look at this other place that we use a lot of antibiotics in sheep, this year-round oxytetracycline use is mostly in the treatment of lameness. So let's have a little think about how we can control lameness without the use of antibiotics. We have three different causes of infectious lameness in sheep. Uh, we've got intradigital dermatitis that you might call a scald or a scad or a strip. There's foot rot and there's this kind of emerging disease, contagious ovine di digital dermatitis, or COD. I've got some pictures which are hopefully clear. Does anyone want to have a bash at what these are, what these pictures are? You can go left, middle and right. It's called. It's called. You know that's called? Right. Right. In between the feet. Yeah. What about this one? Uh, okay. Yeah, well, when the Jews were good. Have we got any advance? I can see some experienced farm farmers in the room. Any advance on these two? You think that's fit rock? I think that's fit rock. I'm not sure in the middle. Okay. Well, I'm going to be. I'm going to have to confess that they're all caught. <laughs> Chosen because cod is so difficult to diagnose, unless you know what you're really looking for. So that one is an early cod, has a good going cod, and that's a healed cod, where the, the, that break in the hook horn has grown down the foot. And I think it's just important, each of these infectious causes are treated really differently and approached really differently, and without diagnosing them correctly, you could end up with an ineffective antibiotic treatment. So um, the good news is they're reasonably easily identified by photographs. Um, if so good quality photograph, email to your vet, message to your vet, and a wee discussion, and they'll set you on the right path of what's going on and how to treat it. But then also, there are infectious causes of lameness. How do we stop bringing them onto our farms? And recently, 2014 ish, there was a five point plan brought in. And this five point plan um, in farms that implement it ha has been shown to, to reduce lameness. So if you've got a serious lameness problem on your, on your small holding or on your farm, you definitely want to have a think about vaccinating um, and have a chat to your vet about how you use vaccination to aid in the control of lameness on that farm. If you don't have a lameness problem, fantastic. The last thing you want to do is bring in a lameness problem on new stock coming in. That, that, you know, that would be a disaster. So how do we prevent that happening? We want to quarantine your new additions, ideally inside on concrete, because the last thing you want to do is taking their slightly buggy feet onto the soil, but certainly you want them somewhere where your other sheep are not going to be and not get into contact with. 
and you're going to have a little look at them. You're going to have a good look at the feet, give them a few days to develop lameness and signs of disease that they might have picked up during transport, and identify and treat it before it gets out, out to your, your main block. Um, if you do um, have lame, lame animals, you want to identify them, you want to identify this, you want to treat them really early so that they don't spend as little time as possible shedding these infectious bacteria onto your ground and providing a, a potential pool of infection for the other sheep on the farm. Avoid routine foot trimming. Now, if you speak to farmers, they'll feel equally excited at the fact they don't have to trim feet anymore and equally quite weary of not trimming feet anymore. They've been doing it for a lot of years. But routine foot trimming of a sound animal has been shown to increase your incidence of lameness and increase your amount of foot rub. So if she's sound, it doesn't matter if it looks awful, leave it alone. Um, so yeah, avoid your routine foot trimming. It's a, it's a get out of jail free power for you. And then this last one's quite tricky for, for um, small holders, which who generally have, have formed a little bit more of a relationship with their, with their sheep, their big old names. Um, and to cull a persistently lame sheep is really tricky. But that sheep, um, there's a number of reasons. One, if she's constantly lame, she's constantly in pain. And is that really what you want for your sheep? If she's constantly getting reinfected with the likes of foot rot, she is constantly shedding more of a foot rot bacteria onto your soil and will be spreading um, infection around. She's also genetically predisposed to foot rot. Um, you don't want to breed from her. You don't want to breed more little sheep with chronic foot rot that are going to be chronically. So you, you, it's really tricky. I can, I can encourage you, should there be a lame sheep, that you really, really should think about what's in the best interest of the sheep and what's in the best interest of the other sheep on the farm. So, I, I have to talk about how to identify a bacterial disease. I felt I had to, but I found it really difficult. It's really, there's no clear-cut rules and it's not straightforward to look at something and say, that has a bacterial disease. Um, it takes a lot of knowledge over the years and I think even vets sometimes struggle to be absolutely sure but their index of suspicion of bacterial disease could go up. But what is going to make you think I wonder if this sheep needs antibiotics or this cow needs antibiotics? If they've got a high temperature, I've got my little normal temperatures there. So a high temperature indicates infection. And that infection can be bacterial but it also can be viral. So we want to be a little bit wary but if we've got a high temperature we're starting to, to wonder whether this animal needs some antibiotics. Um, if there's pus, there's usually bacteria around. If there's a smelly discharge, if something absolutely stinks, be that discharge in between the feet um, or discharge kind of after lambing, if it's smelly, there's likely to be some bacteria around and we're likely to think about using antibiotics. And of course, we've got a caveat, a condition called caseous lymphadenitis in sheep. Um, causes abscesses, causes pus, but it's not something that responds to antibiotics. It's not a bacteria that responds to antibiotics, and realistically, that animal also needs to hold. And if we identify a disease that we know is bacterial, so for the most part, pneumonia is bacterial, but don't be get caught out by the coughing lamb with lungworm. But pneumonia is generally bacterial. Metritis, was in, which is infection of the, of the uterus, again, most commonly after lambing and calving. Mastitis generally is, if we see an abscess, they generally are. Navel ill, joint ill, they're all usually bacterial. Um, but another big caveat down the bottom, as so I've already alluded to, is not all bacterial diseases need to be treated or should be treated with antibiotics. And so this is where your vet becomes involved in managing the disease and deciding what you should use and when. And when we do reach for the antibiotic, we're happy that we've got a bacterial disease. How should, how should we use it? So again, avoid the just-in-case treatments and definitely avoid that one's got a sore foot. So actually, three out of my six sheep have got a sore foot. I'm just going to give them all a jag. That's, that's the sort of thing that we could be cutting back on. Only the three affected animals need an, uh, uh, an injection of antibiotics. Your other three don't have a big bacterial disease at the time. 
and therefore don't be treated with antibiotics. And the other thing we can do to, to avoid antibiotic in the whole animal, the whole microbiome, and all of its bacteria, is to use topical treatments. So that's things like, like eye drops um, or eye creams, um, but also topical antibiotic sprays. So your, your blue spray for a fresh skull for an example. So we're, we're back to audience participation, guys. <laughs> This is a sheep, she's about a week from lambing, you've gone out in the morning and this is what she looks like. Do we think she needs some antibiotics? Well, three, two, one, and you're just going to shout all the water. Three, two, one. No. Oh. Excellent, next slide. Ten out of ten, well done. She's most, most likely going to be metabolic, it's either going to be calcium deficiency or twin lamb disease. Um, probably going to treat her with calcium, if she doesn't get up in an hour it's probably twin lamb disease. I need to treat for that instead. So, a sheep or a cow with a retained cleaning or a retained placenta. Any thoughts? No. No? Oh, I like that, yes. What if she's sick? What if she's, what if she's sick and unwell with it? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, yeah, maybe. Look, there it is on the side. Fantastic. So yeah, generally if they're well, they're coping with it. The infection it might be pretty stinky, which is one of our earlier rules. It might be pretty stinky, but the likelihood is that as long as they're well, they're eating and fine and happy, they're not systemically unwell, and they're coping with, with that infection and they'll get rid of it on their own in their own time. However, if they're sick, that suggests that that infection has crossed over the, the um, the uterus and is now affecting the whole animal. She's systemically unwell and she would be well to have some antibiotics. So if we do decide we want to treat it early, we want to use the correct drug, the correct dose for the correct duration, that's possibly going to involve a wee phone call to your, your vet just to figure out exactly what you're going to treat them for and when. Sore sheep's eye. I've kind of given this one away already. going to be bacterial. We're not on the balance of probabilities, this is going to be a bacterial condition. We're going to use a topical treatment if we can. We're not going to use an aerosol spray and anyone that does needs to spray it in their own eye first. <laughs> if anyone's interested, that's my mom that shouted that one out. <laughs> Fabulous. So, the calf with scour. What are we going to do with the calf with scour? No. No. Have we got consensus across the room that we're not? Oh, there's nodding. There's some. Is that agreeing, or are you going to give antibiotics? You're going to give antibiotics. No. So the vast majority of neonatal scars are either um, viral. So in younger calves, you're looking at your rotaviruses, your coronaviruses. As they get a little bit older, it tends to be par parasitic, and your cryptosporidiosis and your coccidiosis. The, the faint exception is really early diarrheas that are E. coli based, your K99 E. coli, but even then it is very much more fluids and supportive therapy and only some of them will get antibiotics. So for your general scour and your sad looking calf, rehydration um, and supportive treatment is all that's needed. And you will please, this is the last one. This little lame lamb, we just put them out of the shed. Absolutely typical, into the kind of big field and the next morning you've got this. What are we going to do? Are we going to use antibiotics? No. No, there's no way. We've got a mixed, a mixed crowd. Yes. It's most likely going to be a bacterial condition. Um, so again, we're going to treat it early as soon as we see it's going to get lame. Uh, we're going to use the correct dog, drug at the correct dose for its weight for the correct duration. And now this is where this one gets tricky. Because if you just catch that lame lamb as it's hobbling around the field, give it one dose of antibiotic, tomorrow it's not going to be sound, but it's going to be fit enough to outrun you, and you're not going to get your second dose of antibiotic into it. So bring them back in. If you can, bring them back into the shed and give it a proper duration of treatment and make sure it's absolutely cleared up before you let them go. Fabulous. I think that. Oh no, we haven't stopped the audience participation. So, I think what we've proved there is pretty tricky to know, given a particular sick animal, 
whether we should be using antibiotics or whether we should shouldn't. So where do we go to get the information to make that decision? So I've got some options. I've got the farmer, the experienced farmer next door. We've got a book. We've got a friendly neighbourhood vet. Uh, we've got Dr Google. And then we've got on the internet some fairly good independent websites. Can anyone think of any pros and cons of various? And you're allowed to criticise the vet option too. Do we think, where are we? The book is a good place to go. Yeah, on balance, books are pretty good, reliably printed. Watch the out of dateness. 2000 was 20 years ago now. Um, so, you know, make sure you've got an up to date book. The only other disadvantage is you've got to just about know what you're dealing with before you can get the treatment recommendations. So, that can be a bit tricky. But they were definitely places for, for referring to the book. Um, what about the farmer next door? Makes, I, do you know what? There is such a wealth of knowledge in the farmer next door. He has so much experience. He will tell you things and have dealt with things um, that you know, you'll never have imagined before. There's so much experience there. They are a little bit of a proponent of the just-in-case antibiotic. The, the, better to err on the, the type of caution and they're more likely to just-in-case. I've just got one here in my truck. So I would just be a little bit aware um, and so they're, they're very useful, very helpful in a lot of situations. Possibly not your first port of call for a sick animal, but definitely a resource that you should be tapping into. Um, how do we feel about Dr. Google? Oh, there's, there's yeah. Again, I think all of you will be professionals in your own right doing something slightly different. And all of you will go online and see things that make you cringe and think, oh, that's bad advice. I just, or you see something um, that, yeah, you just you don't agree with is bad advice. And the same is true, true with veterinary medicine. It's really hard when you go on Google to pick the good stuff from the bad stuff. Um, and you almost need a degree of knowledge in the field to know what's good advice and bad advice. So beware going with Dr. Google. These sites um, are my little exception. Um, they're independent, they're full of really useful information. It's written really well, it's really clear. Um, and if you're going to go on Google, head in that direction. How do we feel about our friendly neighbourhood bed? Mid cows, these are my little things. I'm not answering our phone right now. So there's your, your optimal person who's going to have the knowledge of disease, of diagnosing disease, of what causal agents are going to be there, of what antibiotics are going to kill that causal agent, but they're pretty busy people and they can be a little bit unavailable sometimes. Um, so Carrie's going to call you back as soon as she's finished stitching up the cow, but you know there might be a little bit of a delay in between phoning them and getting the advice. So yeah, definitely the best source of information. Definitely tap into it where you can, but there might be situations where you feel things are a bit urgent, bets are not giving you a phone back, and you need to go elsewhere to get the information. You'll be pleased, I'm just about going to stop rattling on that, you know? So, just to sum up, we've, we've got lots of things that we can do to prevent bacterial disease, and in preventing bacterial disease means we don't need to use um, antibiotics. We can use vaccination, we can improve our hygiene measures, we can give lambs and calves, I should put calves in there, anything little, anything newborn needs colostrum and we'll do much better having given it huge quantities of colostrum. You can't give too much, make sure you get the colostrum into them. And also making sure we don't bring bacterial infections onto our farms and our units um, by effectively quarantining, looking for problems um, and identifying them before we let them spread to the rest of our flock. And then when we do think that there's maybe a bacterial problem going on, we're going to treat it early with the correct drug at the correct dose for the correct duration and most likely the best place to get that information is from your vet. I think that's it. There is huge amounts. Um, I've alluded to most of them. There's RUMA, there's Pharmbiotics, which is a, an offshoot of RUMA, Cute Veterinary Society, AHCB. There's lots of fantastic um, 
stop in there, go and check out their websites. We've got a little list of references and then a cute picture of a sheep. So we'll just go to this cute picture of the sheep and say any questions. That's a relief. Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you very much for your patience and your time. Thank you very much.